Your Bay. Welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. Up first, what will the Biden-Harris administration look like? Despite roadblocks thrown up by President Trump, some continuing lawsuits and no official transition support, President-elect Joe Biden is preparing to take office in January. Data from the transition team shows 46% of the staff are people of color, 52% are women, and 53% of the senior staff are women. With us today are Latifa Lyles, a vice president at Time's Up, Rena Shaw, founder of Republican Women for Biden, Tiana Lowe of the Washington Examiner, and former judge and federal prosecutor, Deborah Carnahan. All right, let's start with you, Latifa Lyles, former head of the uh, Women's Bureau at the Labor Department under President Obama and several other titles now with Time's Up. But will uh, President Biden's cabinet look more like America than President Trump's cabinet did? Well, I think anyone will say that there's going to be no comparison compared to the current president. Um, The Biden-Harris administration will be the most diverse administration in the history. Um, And I'm confident of that. And I think that um, the message that the campaign sent and the message that now uh, Biden-elect is sending is that uh, we need an administration, we need leadership positions that mean girls and boys across the nation will see and learn from a new generation of women leaders in particular, and it's going to change our culture, not just in diversity and representation, but in thought. And what does that look like as we move forward um, on policies to move our country ahead? So um, do, do, what does that say to you, Rena, as uh, a founder of a Republican women for Biden. Is that is that a good thing that we're going to have more women and more people of color, or is it a turnoff to the voters who voted for Trump, whom uh, Joe Biden said he would try to, you know, he would be the whole country's president, not just the red states or the blue states president? Certainly, former Vice President Biden and now our president-elect has an uphill battle ahead of him. The Biden-Harris administration uh, seeks to unify, as they've been telling us for so many weeks. And uh, this is not an easy task to undertake on day one when some 72 million of my fellow Americans voted for this president to be reelected, President Trump to be reelected. So the reality is, is that uh, you know this is, this is a moment where we can look at the positive. And uh, the positive is that Biden is somebody who has never changed his tone. He's been very consistent. And I'm reminded of an op-ed that he wrote and and in in which he said, cabinet, we have to make sure that our leadership and our institutions actually look like America. And so I've been looking for reflective representation. I don't think that's a partisan thing to want that. I, of course, as a longtime conservative, really always want the most qualified person versus somebody being handpicked for their ethnicity or their gender. Um, and look, more transition team announcements are coming soon. But one thing we know for sure is that this is a transition team. This is a uh, that looks far different than Trump's. It, that 46% of Biden's transition team are people of color. 41% of his senior staff are people of color. And when you look at Trump, look, his cabinet was more white and more male than any cabinet in almost 40 years. Only 25% of senior staff on Trump's campaign were people of color. So those numbers were really dismal. And again, we're not reflective of this this beautiful uh, quilt we have out here, this tapestry that we've woven in this country of people of very diverse backgrounds and experiences. Tiana, your thoughts, is that going to appeal? Is is Biden's uh, cabinet selection? We we heard as of this taping that Deborah Holland, uh, who was just elected as a Democrat from New Mexico uh, to the House, is uh, a strong candidate for interior. We don't know yet, as of this taping, about Treasury or, or defense or state, which, of course, are the three most important, most powerful positions. But and Holland, by the way, would make history as the first uh, Native American and the first woman and combination thereof to uh, run the Interior Department. So just as an aside, I think it's important to note, as we're going to talk about diversity, that every single GOP pickup in the House went to either a woman, a person of color or a veteran. 
And also, we saw, I mean, the only reason why Trump was within reaching distance of the presidency was largely because of gains among Latino men. As it turns out, the messaging against socialism really did work in South Florida. Um, with regards to Holland, that, that makes obvious sense, given the, the nature of the role of the uh, Secretary of the Interior. They're responsible for most of our uh, jurisdiction over uh, native territories and native, native sovereignty. With regards to diversity, Joe Biden hasn't just signaled he's going to have an ethnically check off the, you know, demographics boxes kind of style diversity, but also ideological diversity. You know, you have Cindy McCain on his transition team. He has made it clear that he wants to be a legislator. He always liked going to Congress. Professor Obama would go to the Hill and pontificate towards people for hours, get nothing done, send Joe down there, and in 15 minutes, a deal is done. So I am, and to this day, you still hear conservatives like Ted Cruz saying nice things about Joe Biden. They all like him on a personal level. So yeah, you know, I mean, there are certain nominations that have the potential to terrify, I think, most conservatives. I think no one like of, you know, a... a uh, Susan, Susan Rice as Secretary of State, I think yeah. they're afraid of her. I mean, that, 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 it will not go through, especially if Republicans do Senate seat securing, you know, a, a majority that will not require or not allow Kamala Harris to, to uh, break a tie. But in some places, there's a little bit of promise. He's already talking about maybe having Meg Whitman on his, on his, in his cabinet. Meg Whitman was the Republican nominee for governor of California. So, I mean, I would say Republicans shouldn't waste this opportunity to actually, you know, we can finally have infrastructure week with a President Joe Biden and a Republican Congress. Because if there's one thing everyone in Washington agrees, it's great to spend taxpayer money while we have trillions of dollars of bipartisan debt. Um, but, you know, sunny side up, we'll see. <laughs> and your thoughts, um, you have been well, behind the scenes, Deb, and working with your husband, who was a member of Congress from Missouri, um, working on transitions before. Are you going to be working on this one, and how do you expect it to be different? Yeah, um, there are a lot of transitions going on in the House, uh, not just in the executive branch. Um, and I know that it's a really crucial, intimate uh, time where you really have to get up and running fast. And unfortunately, the uh, Biden campaign is being crippled by our current President Trump. I think they're moving forward. Well, completely, well. completely disabled. Would you say no. it's held back because no. they are they're on right. they're moving forward like Trump just doesn't exist anymore. Yes, and I think it's very interesting and heartening that we have private organizations who are experts on foreign affairs and um, affairs of state that are stepping in and using their knowledge and their expertise to help the Biden transition, even if you know they can't do that because GSA you know, won't allow it at this point. Um, I think that I want to reiterate a little bit of what everybody said. Um, you know, Joe Biden really loves the politics. He's like a Bill Clinton. And I've known Joe and Jill for over 30 years. And they really like people. I'm not saying that President Obama and Michelle didn't like people, but they were more processed oriented. They weren't the shake the hands, the stay up forever, be three hours late on your schedule. They well, were let's, very let's different presidents. They were, they were more um, sort of, they were Ivy Leaguers and, uh, and, yeah. and Vice President Biden, former VP Biden, campaigned on the fact that he didn't go to an Ivy League. Right, school. exactly, exactly. And um, so we're going to see something very different uh, than the Obama administration, but I also think to give the Obama administration credit, there was a lot of forward thinking emphasis on diversity for one of the first times probably in the history of our presidency. Um, and I think Joe Biden's going to build on that. And I think because of that, we're going to see a lot of diversity in high level positions. And that's what's important. High level. Talk, talk to me. Talk to me about the three most powerful and most coveted um, cabinet seats, which are tre Treasury uh, Secretary, Defense Secretary, and Secretary of State. 
Who do we expect to see in those positions? Oh, gee, Bonnie, I would have thrown in attorney general on that one, but maybe that's my Justice Department background. Right. Um, it's, it's important, too, but yeah. Well, anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Um, no, I think really at this point, um, Secretary of State is crucial um, to repair our reputation and who we are around the world. And there's not going to be a novice there. And I, and I heard everybody talking about, um, you know, Susan Rice, and there may be a problem in the Senate with that. The Senate can't just knock down every single one of President to be uh, Biden's appointees. They're going to have to pick and choose. And they're going to have a hard time not confirming Susan Rice. Hard I time. Would, mm -hmm. I would also add that there's going to be, uh, there's opportunity for some for additional history making. And if you think about the powers, not only in the cabinet, but if you think about the military and others, the defense department, um, what it looks like in the Joint Chiefs. There's so many opportunities mm -hmm. to have women in those positions that have never been in those positions before, unheard of. And mm -hmm. so, you know, some of the things that we, we talked about state, we talked about attorney general, but I do think that there will be some additional um, bright spots and surprises as well that will come in some of those unexpected places that are not typically thought about in the beginning um, stages here. I totally agree with you. And can I just make a statement here? I am looking forward to the Biden administration bringing back the Office of Women's Issues and Outreach to the White House that was destroyed by President Bush, right. that was Trump. initiated by the Clintons. We need that office. Didn't it exist under the Obamas and then Trump took it out again? Yeah, so under the Obama administration, the Council on Women and Girls was formed as an interagency response, looking at policies and outreach and engagement across not only cabinet level agencies, but across government. Um, and that council was headed by senior staff in the White House. Um, Valerie Jarrett was the chair of the Council on Women and Girls, and it took a cross-cutting approach. We definitely know that there are going to be even more opportunities to take that approach. Plus, as you mentioned, the office structure that existed before to have even more senior voices on those critical issues, including okay, when, when, you say cross, women. when you say cross cutting, please, for the audience, explain what you mean and explain how that's going to transition into changed laws in these countries that affect women and girls. We've we've seen that the recession, for example, that the the this recession that we're in has disproportionately affected women. Four times as many women are out of the workforce, many of them forever, possibly, uh, because of what's going on with with COVID. And how will that how what kind of legislation do you think the Biden administration will be pushing to try to change that? Well, as you mentioned, Bonnie, we are at such a critical time right now. Families are, are suffering. Um, careers have been put on hold. Uh, we have a crisis of care and caregiving, both with young children and also with older relatives and our own personal care. Um, for sure, there's going to be a focus in the early days of how to jumpstart and restart and move forward the economy, but also what does it mean to have um, a strong economy with caregiving, which is very much at the center right now. What does that look like? How do we invest in childcare and in um, other caregiving programs that we know families desperately need and always have, but COVID has certainly highlighted the, the gaps that we have in those areas. And as it relates to the workforce, absolutely. You know, the, there are multiple tools that the administration is gonna have at hand, not only legislation, as you point out, Bonnie, but there's also going to be executive action, undoing some of the, the harms and the executive orders put in place by the, the current president and moving forward with the power of the president's office on executive orders and other commissions and policies and budgets that can affect not only um, what's happening within the cabinet level agencies, but how they're funded. So there's a there's a there's a host of tools in the toolbox. It's not just limited 
to Congress, although Congress is certainly one of those tools, but how out of the gate we're going to both focus on uh, e economic and the budget um, and the concerns of working families, and then how we can use the levers of the president's office across government. So that could be HHS, that could be the Department of Labor, and who those key folks in the White House working with those agencies on policy is going to be very critical. You know, this this has been a baseball bat, ping pong ball kind of thing going back and forth between administrations, but every Democrat who comes in lifts the global gag rule, which prevents US AID funds from going to countries uh, if, if and, and it's money that's supposed to be going towards uh, expanding the, the reach and the availability of family planning. And if that country engages, uh, allows abortions, uh, that money stops. So, but it's always been done on the first day in office, or at least over the last few administrations. Are we going to see it this time, um, Deborah, uh, on Biden's first day to lift the global gag rule? I think actually you will. I mean, he has his own personal beliefs, but you know, the Mexico City, you know, doctrine was horrible doctrine. I saw that firsthand in Ethiopia when they spent 12 days going around Ethiopia on women's issues and health issues. It was an atrocity that you would make a woman walk seven miles to uh, get birth control from where she went just to get an OBGYN examination. And I know personally that Joe and Jill think that that was horrible and that we should not tie um, our personal or religious beliefs to enabling women to take care of their bodies and not have unwanted pregnancies and have health care at the same time. Uh, uh, your thoughts, uh, Rena, about what kind of legislation you want to see this administration pushing? Well, I think, uh, you know, while I do care a great deal about what we as a country have done and as American people, how we've been so philanthropic and are, are the most philanthropic nation in the world, I really do care about the plight of American families right now so much. It's on my mind every minute of every day because my fellow Americans and I are going with another into this holiday season and into the end of the year without another check from this U.S. government. I mean, we are living in the nightmare of this pandemic, what it's done to the lives of people like me who are married to frontline workers, who are families are on the front lines. And then we've had to shoulder really uh, the brunt of, of caregiving entirely. I mean, that this whole conversation about women in the workforce, whether you're self-employed like myself or um, working a nine to five that can be done virtually, or you're in a category where you have no choice but to show up and work and, and mask up and do and say a prayer and you know hope there's enough PPE for you. Um, and these are the women we ought to be caring about. And I have full faith that, that President-elect Biden, as well as VP-elect um, Harris, will do the right thing on day one and right this wrong. This is so awful of this Congress, as well as this administration, to fail us like this, to fail the American people, how we have received one check and these people in Congress think we can go on like this is unconscionable. This is um, this is negligence to the nth degree. I, I just cannot believe it. I'm Like I said, I'm a lifelong conservative, but this is why we pay taxpayer dollars. Literally four times like this, this administration screwed it up. And then you leave us out here with one measly check all year. So I'm thinking about the Treasury Secretary. I want to see a woman in there and I want to see a black woman in there. Because let me tell you what, that Matters. That's a position that really matters. And Mnuchin, I have had it with that guy. I'm so ready to see him go. Um, I'm so sick of black people being appointed to HUD all the time, housing and urban development. You tell me who delivered this election for Biden and Harris, black people. All right. And we, we have very little time left, So, but we're going right now to something completely different. Bring back manly men. That was the controversial tweet from conservative commentator Candace Owens. Owens was mocking British singer Harry Styles for wearing a ball gown on the cover of Vogue. Styles is the first man to grace the cover of Vogue solo. His reaction to Owens and other criticism is there's so much joy to be had playing with clothes, and he didn't think too much about what it means. All right, so Candace Owens said that having styles on the cover of Vogue in a dress is part of a progressives wanting to feminize men. 
Is that, uh, uh, Tiana, I'm going to come to you on this question. Is that, is that, do you see it that way, A, and B, um, if a lot of progressive women think that feminizing men is a way to get rid of to toxic masculinity? Do you agree with that? I mean, for starters, Candace Owens is very good at what she does. She's not a conservative. She's done a very fantastic job at elevating issues that everyone agrees upon. Yes, it's absurd for a man to be wearing a dress, not because he identifies as a woman, but just as pure posturing. And she manages to trigger the libs into overplaying their hand and instead saying, but why would you assume that wearing a dress is feminizing? Why would you apply a gender construct to dresses? Which is obviously absurd. But, you know, she's trending for the upteenth time, and you guys will keep making her famous. With regards to whatever political agenda there is about gender, I don't think it's so planned. And quite frankly, the most sexist, racist, bigoted thing this country is doing is the most sexist, racist, bigoted thing this country has done in my entire lifetime. It's these lockdowns. It is forcing women out of the workplace to distance learn their children because the teachers' unions don't want to show up to work just like our frontline workers have been doing for the last eight and nine months. And so does a Vogue cover really matter? Not quite. Have I ever cared for Harry Styles' music? No. Was it clearly a gimmick to get everyone trending in the news? Yeah, everyone won their culture war. Vogue won their culture war because they can now ignore the fact that Condé Nast has been a historically racist place to work and has been a historically uh, sexist place to work because now they're woke because they showed Harry Styles in a dress and Candace Owens got her Twitter headline. All right, what your thoughts on this, Latifa? You know, I, I I think that the the feelings in the culture surrounding it, less so the fame that this has garnered for her more so and others who are voicing issues around the concern about this, is about the threat. I mean, let's be real. The the concern is the threat. What is what is this image of a man in a, in, a, in a dress threatening? Whether it's acceptable, whether it's fashionable, whether he looks good or not, it it's 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 the contract that's being upended, um, and and it scares people to think that male stronghold, which was tantamount like in her in her quote, is somehow a breakdown in society. If men are not in control, if men are not overly manly, as as she put it in her words, um, then we're slipping. And I say the opposite is true. Um, I think we have enough testosterone and enough manliness to, to last us three and four and five lifetimes. So anything that we can do to, 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 to talk about what that means and break that down and talk about why it's so upsetting, the better. Uh, and Deborah, your thoughts about this? I mean, do you agree with, with Owen's uh, theory that it, progressives want to feminize men, thinking that it will uh, get rid of toxic ma masculinity? Is that a way to do it? Or is it just something that people ought to really ignore? Yeah, Bonnie, ignore it. I'm too much of a student of history. And these types of discussions come out of ignorance. Look at history. Look at dress. Look at strong leaders who are male, you know, and they're in dresses, they're in tunics. You've got Jesus Christ walking around, you know, with basically a Roman garb and that goes to his knees and, a, and it's a skirt, it's a dress. This is dog whistling to me. It's dog whistles. Um, fashion is fashion. Do what you want to do. We saw this in the 70s when women started wearing pantsuits. I remember growing up in Alexandria, Virginia, if I wanted to wear pants to school, I had to put them underneath my skirt. When I went to my piano lessons in Old Town Alexandria, my piano teacher required a skirt over my pants. What are we talking about here? Get over it. It's dog whistling. All right. Br very briefly, Rena, two sentences. Your thought. Is this all just a jacked up uh, publicity play by Vogue, by Harry Styles, by Candace Owens, or is it is it a real social issue? 
You know, I think uh, Candace Owens, to me, really, she she's successful at what she does because she takes a different tone with things. It's not the tone that I would take, but uh, I, I do think there are people out there who are afraid of what a man in a dress signals to their very young children. And I think, uh, to me, the children that I'm trying to raise, everything in my ideology, uh, politically especially, it, it begins in the home. Uh, for me. And so I can teach my young children, uh, both girls, to look at that and say, that's his choice. Okay. Thank you all. This was a fantastic discussion. Much appreciated. Please follow us on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and go to our PBS website, which is www.pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next time. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. Be more. PBS.